Hello everybody, this is Jade, and I'd like to start with apologizing for the loud banging that is probably going to go through this entire episode. I am not the only person who lives in this house, and unfortunately this is legitimately the best time that I can record this. I also want to show you guys, um, most people have noticed the roses that are in every episode. Um, they're basically dead now, but um, Blake and Rose were doing really, really bad at the end of this section, so I decided to leave them and not throw them away for one more week. But I also added this little bird that is now attached to the bigger rose, so That's my boy. So this week we're covering chapters 4.10 through 5.4 of uh, Pact by Wild Bill. I wanted to finish arc 5 for this week, but I felt like 5.4 was a pretty decent stopping point since they were going to be going into another major fight at the end, at the start of the next chapter. So I decided to just read through 5.4. Um, and an awful lot happens in in these eight chapters, so maybe I'll eventually finish this book one day. Maybe. So last week's episode I spent a lot of time ranting about how much I was disappointed in the press in the practitioners of this world for just all being assholes and nobody really trying and people taking advantage of the people who are trying to just kill them, you know, and I, I I was honestly starting to get really worried about this book because I I don't like villain protagonists and I don't like assholes. I don't like reading books where your only option is to be a dick. Um, and Blake, Blake had a lot of stuff on his mind, but he wasn't putting any serious effort into, or, or thought into trying to do the right thing. Um, not that I feel like Blake needs to constantly be going around thinking about what the best possible thing to do is, but with everybody treating him like he's going to become some kind of evil nuke, I was really worried that where this book was going was Blake just kind of going off a slippery slope, and I didn't want to read that. <laughs> I just don't. Um, so I hope you all had a good laugh at me last week because this whole section is largely about Blake gathering the courage and conviction to commit to trying to do what's right for his the rest of his presumably very short life. Um, and I and for that reason I I really like this section and I'm also really glad that I cut off this divide between the two sections where I did um, because it allowed me to go on that really long rant last week and then be so pleasantly surprised this week when we when we took the turns that we did in these chapters. So this week we start off already talking to the Knights of the Basement who are this incredibly sad group of people who run a convenience store out in the middle of Nowheresville and Blake talks a lot to these people about you know, the stuff that has happened to them and what he needs to know to fight the demon that he's going to be fighting tomorrow. But an interesting theme that permeates this whole chapter is is this idea of, of permanence. Um, and I'm gonna keep an eye on it, but there's this nothing will ever be the same again thing. And it and it's kind of permeated in this book. Like you see a lot of a lot of the knights have, like, one guy has his foot badly injured, and, um, and the son of Nick with the shotgun, he, he used to have a girlfriend, but now he doesn't remember anything about her, and, and it's, it's just this idea that once, once something happens to you, you are fundamentally changed. You can't go back to the way you were before, and, among these people, we don't really see anything having gotten better for them or having the opportunity to get better for them. 
When you compare them to Blake, who keeps thinking about how he would like to be able to go home after this, he would like to be able to f fix everything up within his life as a practitioner and then just be able to go back to being a handyman. Um, it just reminds you that the, likely the, the likelihood of that, buddy, is probably pretty low. Y you can't go back to the way you were before. Honestly, at the end of last chapter 4.9, I was not incredibly curious about this conversation. The Knights of the Basement have a cool name, but I went, oh, you know, this is gonna be, you know, just some group of people that Blake is gonna be talking to, whatever. But actually, this is the most I've ever cared about a group of people that were just introduced that I don't know anything about. Like, the only thing I could really tell you about them as individuals are their names. Um, they don't really have any... They don't really have any distinct qualities other than they look like they hang out at a truck stop. Another thing that contributes to the, um, to the whole theme of something happens to you and your life is never the same is this idea that now that now Blake is a diabolist. A diabolist. He'll never, he'll never, he can never claim to not be a diabolist again. And um, he looks, he said he looked at this propaganda, uh, which is black lamb's blood, um, that have complete, that has completely changed his outlook on diabolism. He basically implies to the knights that he'll never look at diabolism the same horrible way again. An interesting thing that happens in this chapter is he um, he actually takes a sandwich from the knights and a coke and he takes like a million rides from them so he's going to have to pay that back at some point um, so we'll see where that goes they ask him if he loves rose and he has like this internal soliloquy where he says do i love rose does that make me a narcissist um yeah, the question, does Blake love Rose, is asked, like, maybe not every single chapter, but basically every other chapter or more frequently. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's that's one of the central questions of this book. Um, does Blake love Rose and what does that mean? And the, the Deep Impact guys um, met, actually went over this and they said, yes, Blake does seem to love Rose, and I, and I, and I agree. He clearly cares about her, but I think all three of us have a much looser definition of love than Blake does. Um, he seems reluctant to define something as love, um, which is just a difference that goes from person to person. Um, so yeah, we'll see where this goes. And of course, the knights tell him, if you have to think about whether you love her, you should probably just let her die. At the end of this, I wrote in my notes this was my new favorite chapter, um, especially with the collection of all the awesome ghosts that we saw at the end of 4.10, but um, that this was my least favorite chapter in this whole section, so that tells you where this is going. So now let's talk about 4.11. Fun fact, um, so last week I wrote in my notes, child in long hooded jacket, not a ghost. Um, but I decided not to say anything about that. Um, I actually could have sworn I put girl in long hooded jacket, not a ghost. I knew that- I knew the ghost was going to be important, but I should have had better judgment to call it out so that it would look more impressive. But, whatever. So I should preface this with saying... I've mentioned a couple times that there's some stuff that I know about Pact. I thought we had completely run out of things that I know about Pact, but there's one other detail that I knew knew about Pact going in, and that is that there was a character named Evan that everybody loved. Um, and that's that's not real knowledge, but um, I knew that Evan existed and that people liked him. Um, so now I, I want to talk, um, I want to talk about Evan for a little bit, and I'm going to talk about Evan for a little bit here, and then I'm going to have several more sections during this episode where I just monologue about Evan for a while because I love this child. Something that I don't think has been brought up nearly enough when people talk about Wildbo's works is Wildbo has this incredible talent and skill for writing kids. 
Ask any person who has seen The Phantom Menace to describe that movie to you. Um, anyone over the age of 20. Or have them describe your their feelings for Anakin in, in The Phantom Menace. Most of the time they will they will not think that Anakin was a Anakin at the age of nine or twelve. He was supposed to be twelve in the script. I read that somewhere. Um, most of the time people will not think twelve year old Anakin was a gift to cinema. I actually follow this this YouTuber named Dominic Noble who reviews books and movies and stuff. But one of the things that he does is he reviews examples of weird types of romance novels um, or like overly specific types of romance novels. So like he'll do a video on Amish romance novels or Mpreg romance novels and stuff and he'll talk and, and he doesn't and he's not going into these because he really likes them. He'll just talk about like what it is and stuff. And um, some so I, I think these are fascinating. So he'll talk about um, the plot and stuff of a typical one of these novels. And something that becomes very apparent, it's apparent in romance novels, but it, it kind of follows you everywhere, is that most of the time in media you've got, you've got one of two or a third types of children. They're, the kid is either an adorable darling, a little shit, or in rare cases, the savior of humanity. Looking at you, Anakin Skywalker. And those are the default child personalities that an author can draw on if they need a kid. Uh, come up with a normal sounding name, give them some normal looking clothes, and give them one of those three personalities. And you're done. You've written a child. And that's what every kid is like in any, pretty much any media that is intended for people over the age of 15. Um, Stranger Things, you can tell that they intend kids to watch it. But most of the time, unless something is very, very well written, they will take the shortcut child template. Wild Bo's books, on the other hand, are, are not at all like this. Um, for one, you the books would no, be nowhere near the same if you took away the almost excessive number of small children running around, but they're all very well fleshed out characters. In Worm, under the age of 13, we've got Aisha, Vista, Dinah, Bonesaw, and Labyrinth, all of whom are under the age of 13, or are 13, and get their own interlude and their own goals and personality and stuff. And they're all very well fleshed out characters. And then all of them grow up in a way that is believable by Ward, and we get a whole new set of children. Um, Primarily Aiden, Kenzie, Darlene, Candy, and Chris. And then we've got even minor characters who are children who are super fascinating. The character right now in Ward, in Ward that I'd like to learn most learn more most about is Roman, who has had like 10 lines, and he's just some 13-year-old boy. And I'm like, I want to know more about this kid. Um, so Wildo has this crazy, crazy talent with writing children. Um, and I think that that is an incredibly important aspect of all of his books. So that's that's how I want to preface this whole talk on Evan. Um, I will say I did not think that Evan was eight until somebody, until much later. Um, for one, every single name that I just named was between the ages of 11 and 13. So my default main character, Wildbow Child, is 12. Uh -huh. <laughs> But he also has the survival skills of a, of a particularly effective Boy Scout. So I assumed that he was much older than he was, but he's eight. So Blake is running around in the woods being chased by the hyena when he several times repeatedly runs into this little boy who is wearing his little hoodie and seems to be much more alive than most of the other ghosts, which is definitely something that will come back later, 100%. And the kid helps Blake a couple of times, and Blake starts thinking about how he would like to be able to help the ghost, but he's not going to. He even thinks of Alexis um, bringing him up out of his despair um, post him running away from home, but um, he doesn't think that there's anything that he could do uh, to help any of these ghosts other than um, 
binding the hyena. But as he spends more time around this kid, he starts to he starts to genuinely care for and want to help him. And around the time that Blake asks if asks the little boy if he is the hyena, I stopped. And I had this I had this itch in the back of my head, and I was like, all right, I'm supposed to know something here. What is it? I, d I was not supposed to know something there. I thought there was a puzzle and it wasn't. But I did what what Blake does when he deals with ghosts, um, which was, if you can't figure out what the ghost deal is from looking at their surroundings, look within your own heart and figure out how the ghost is influencing you, right? So I thought about how I felt and I went, I've known this kid for two pages and I would kill for him. And I went, this is Evan. Anyway, now I did not figure out that Evan was the familiar. So there, there's a little bit of a character change in Blake, which we're gonna talk about soon, but um, we see the first real evidence of this when at the end of this chapter, um, Evan tells Blake that he has been waiting for somebody to come and help him for the last year, less than a year because it was last fall, but we don't know how long ago that was. Um, and Blake says, like I said, kiddo, help already came. And it is just this badass moment where you go, oh shit. Blake's gonna do something cool. I got super hyped over this. I was really excited. I, I read with like a really herky-jerky pace. I'll read like four paragraphs and then get up and then read six paragraphs and then read two sentences and then I'll read like six chapters. Um, this whole section I read with... I, I was basically unable to tear my attention away from definitely the most sucked in to the story I've been so far, which I say every week. In 4.12, in the first section, Blake and Evan are running around in the forest, dealing with the ghosts and stuff. At some point, Evan wants to run away, because that's that's his whole thing. And, um, well, that's the thing that his ghost has recorded and he keeps, he keeps going back to. And, and Blake tells him that he wants him to stay with him. And he wants him to, he wants Evan to help him. And there's this, there's this moment where he says that he wanted to put his arms on Evan's shoulders for support. Um, and what did, what did that say? And at that point, I actually teared up. That was, I, I wrote in the Discord where I do the live read for this, that mark it 4.12, first tears for pack. Um, because Blake has had nobody for this whole book. He and Rose have always been at arm's length. If they ever get closer than arm's length to each other, it will be because this entire book has passed, and that's the development that has occurred. Um, he can't talk to his friends, and he can't talk to Joel, and he can't talk to any of the other practitioners, and he can't really talk to Maggie. Um, the fact that there is somebody that Blake wants to protect and wants to be close to is just there's an amount of catharsis in it, even though Blake continues to be in deep shit for the rest of this section. Um, it feels as if there is something falling into place at this point. So he captures the hyena and binds it and takes it back to Conquest and all that stuff. He, uh, he leaves Rose where she is, which Conquest said that she would continue to be asleep for today, so we expected that. And then he goes back to get Evan. So for one, I actually thought that he was taking Evan back to his parents. Um, I don't know why I thought that. Mostly because I, I didn't expect that Evan's body would still be there. So he shows Evan that he's dead and that he and that he's a ghost. And Evan decides that he does not want to move on. And I really appreciated the fact that Blake waited until after he asked Evan whether he wanted to move on to the afterlife to ask him whether he wanted to be his familiar. But, um... So he asks Evan if he wants to be Blake's familiar. And at this point, I just started sobbing, right? Like, 
I should preface this with I will cry at car commercials with sufficiently emotional music. So it's it's pretty easy to make me cry over a book, but I also was genuinely very emotionally impacted by by this decision. I want to talk for a little while about why Blake chose Evan to be the familiar and why it's a good idea. Who you choose as your familiar is supposed to decide how you want to interact with others, both in the lowercase and in the uppercase sense of the word others. Um, and how does, how does Blake want to interact with others? And this is where I'm kind of reaching, but I, I feel like I'm right. Blake wants to be a man. Um, he, he, he is, at this point, the man of the Thorburn household. And the other, it, all of his other female family members lean on him for emotional support. Molly, Paige, and maybe eventually Rose. What brings up this whole idea is that Blake gives this sort of speech in paragraph form back in 4.3. It says, um, because when it came, when it all came down to it, push to shove, I wasn't really much of a man. Not when someone or something bigger and stronger than me had their hands on me. Not when I was unharmed and certain there was nothing I could do. I had precedent for that. Once he grabbed me, I was as good as dead, because I'd stopped thinking until I was free again, and there was nothing thoughtless I could do to get out of the situation. I wouldn't listen to reason, and it should, and it wouldn't be me fighting like a cornered rat. I'd maybe manage to lash out, fail, and then I'd shut down 100%. So Blake wants to be a... Blake wants to be stronger. Blake wants to be able to protect others, and he wants to be able to protect himself. Others in both senses of the word. Um, when he wants to be the traditional head of the house, he wants to be able to protect his family. He wants to be able to protect people smaller than him, including children, in this case, Evan. He started this whole book with a promise to protect Rose. Additionally, Blake can't bind himself to someone who is bigger than him or stronger than him because of his baggage. He will never be able to be comfortable in a relationship like that. And with Rose, who is his equal in what would hopefully be every conceivable way, he can't ever truly treat her as an equal because she represents the life that he could have had and the man that he could be. But it's a possibility that he can never actually achieve because those options in his life are gone. Rose is who he would have been partially if he hadn't left home. But he did leave home, and he can't ever not have got, not have left home. Um, Evan represents the kind of man that he can be if he makes good choices right now. Um, Evan represents the life where he protects ghosts and saves people who are smaller and more afraid than he is. Right, be right before this section where he asks Evan to be his familiar, he says something that really nails in what... Blake learned from Black Lamb's blood, um, which was, but that didn't mean I couldn't do good. I was glad for what I'd managed to do, clearing out the woods. Not proud, but glad. It was as if a deep-seated worry had less of a hold on me. I could do good. I would do good. Um, before I knew what Black Black Lamb's blood said, I I actually took a screenshot of this because I was I was really excited that Blake had decided to do this, um, to be this person. I'm not sure if Blake would have taken the leap to, to ask Evan to be his familiar if he didn't know, if he didn't have the confidence that he got from reading Black Lamb's Blood. So on that note, let's talk about 4.x, which is, um, the excerpts from Black Lamb's Blood, the book that was given to Blake by the lawyers. Um, I was not, not, not looking forward to this, but I, I didn't think that this was going to go the way it went at all because of what Blake said to the knights. But this this book is exactly what I wanted to read. So I should start with um, the author, who I guess we'll call the, the Lamb. Um, so the Lamb always describes things as, describes the act of writing and some other stuff as masturbatory. Um, and he uses this word like at least three times, masturbatory. So I just want to point something out. So later, later in this book, he um, 
he says that the last time he masturbated was when he was 17 and now he's like an old man. Um, I think the reason why he keeps for describing writing as masturbatory is because it's been so long he's forgotten what masturbating is. There's a lot to this book, but the main point is he makes a lot of points that try to encourage, that, that try to describe what a life could be like for a practitioner, a diabolist, who wants to do the right thing, or not the right thing, the good thing. And he, he gives a couple of points for why being a diabolist is not necessarily bad. He talks about how somebody has to deal with the demons and how the things that you do can actually benefit others. And Blake calls it propaganda. Um, and you know what? Maybe I'll go back and read this a couple more times and find that there's something more sinister to this. But if it is propaganda, I don't care. And here's why. This book was the excuse that Blake wanted. This whole book, people have, this whole book packed, not Black Lamb's Blood, um, people have been telling him that diabolists are the worst, and that if you're a diabolist, you're evil, and that if you're a diabolist, you do bad things. And Blake has kind of held back from trying to do good things, largely because he is under, he was kind of under the impression that he couldn't do those things anymore. Um, maybe that's not the right way of phrasing it, but he didn't, he didn't act like doing good stuff was an option. Um, and after he read this book, there is a palpable change in his behavior. Um, it starts with Fell, when he's in the car with Fell in 4.9, when he argues with Fell and says, yeah, well, there's a difference between knowledge and awareness and all that stuff. When he's running around in the woods with the ghosts, he thinks about Alexis and he thinks about how he wants to be the person who can help the ghosts. And then at the end of the section, he thinks about how he could do good and he would do good. So this propaganda didn't, didn't change Blake's mind about what being a diabolist is, or it did, but what it really did was it gave him the confidence to try. It was something that Blake already wanted to try, but it, it told him that it's possible for him to do good. And now Blake sees it as an option. The thing that I think contributes to this the most is the, is the attitude that the author has to the whole thing, which is whatever anybody says about me, I've accepted it. I'm still going to be a diabolist, and I'm still try going to try to do what I think is good. Uh, and Blake, you, on a reread, you can tell that Blake has been super affected by this narrative. Um, and I hope he sticks with it. It does warn that there will be a lot of diabolists who try to do the right thing um, and, and end up doing a lot of stuff that's bad. And I'm sure we will be encountering that. But this is a huge step up from where we were last week. Like a huge step. So then we get to Conviction 5.1. Um, I'll say off the top, because I didn't know where else to put this, Conviction refers to two major things, I think. Um, one, Bla obviously Blake is in jail. And he's being tried for the murder of poor little Evan. But I think the Conviction, especially because Blake isn't convicted, I think the conviction refers to the reason why Blake chose Evan, which is Evan has more conviction than most of the other characters in this book combined. Um, he continued to run away from the hyena and try to find help for days and days. Somebody called the police. It can only be Phil. So maybe I'm wrong. This is only a prediction, but it has to be Phil, right? The only person who knows that he went after Evan was Fell because he searched for Evan Matthews' house on Fell's phone. So that means that Conquest is messing with Evan, with Blake, again, for no reason. So the police come and frisk Blake. He's super chill and cooperative, but it's, it's still really bad because as you're reading this, you're thinking, well, what could he use to defend himself? Nothing. 
For the last several days, he hasn't done anything that he can tell a group of Muggle police officers that they would possibly believe. I, I don't know how common the insanity plea is in uh, Canada, but I do know that it, like it's only successful in like one quarter of one percent of cases in America, I think. And uh, also, Blake really doesn't want to be put in an asylum. That would be really bad. The interrogation scene is super tense because you don't really blame the police officers, right? I mean, it, it, defini it definitely looks like Blake murdered this eight-year-old boy. And they're treating him like shit because that's how you treat the murderer of an eight-year-old boy. Um, they, they rib him and try to see if he molested Evan before killing him. Um, and it seems like they're just being assholes, but also, wouldn't you want to know that? Like, I don't blame the police officers for doing that. The thing that really changed my mind here was when uh, Duncan put his hand on, Bl on Blake's knee. Um, that was the point when I went from these are police officers with the wrong idea to, wow, I hate this piece of shit. Um, but, you know, hilariously, the fact that Duncan is a behame is really, really to Blake's advantage because before this, he had nothing. There was nothing he could have done. Maybe there was something that he would have pulled out of his ass that I would not have been able to see coming. But I thought about it and I was like, man, wow, Blake is screwed. Rip in peace, you know? Also, like as much as I said that he doesn't, um, he doesn't want to be put in an asylum, um, fortunately, like his friends already think he's crazy. So if that was the route that he decided he wanted to go, you know. So on to 5.2. Um, I should have probably mentioned this at the start, but um, I my favorite chapter in Worm is 22.5, uh, which is where Taylor is locked in a cell for reasons, and she has to figure out how to escape this cell um, using only bugs. And... You can go ahead and stereotype me for being an engineer that my favorite novel-length book is The Martian, but I like the whole we're stuck in a cave with a box of scraps. Um, let's escape the jail cell, which was only one chapter of Worm, but is four chapters of Pact. I was super excited for this. This was awesome. Um, it also, again, helped me to solidify my understanding of how the magic works in this. Um, all the magic made sense and was consistent with what we've seen so far, um, which, again, is not a requirement for fantasy. So, or I liked it a lot. So Blake talks to Evan about being a victim and how being a victim is not your fault. And he even says to him that when he was victimized, it wasn't his fault in an attempt to, in an attempt to convince Evan to stop feeling bad about being hunted by the hyena. Um, and interestingly, Evan doesn't remember this because time is turned back. So, it, so this conversation in the end, um, well, when all is said and done, it's, it's only for Blake's benefit. So it just shows you that already within a few hours of meeting, Evan's presence is benefiting Blake and helping him to grow. The interesting thing about this whole section is that Blake keeps trying to play by the rules and Duncan keeps just breaking the rules and changing the rules. Um, it makes it extremely frustrating to read and it just makes you really hate Duncan. Um, so good job. At one point, Blake re re uh, describes the knights of the basement as being people who are involved in board games or something like that. Maybe it was Dungeons and Dragons or Weaver Dice. Oh yeah, by the way, um, there is a game called Pact Dice that you could learn. Um, it's a tabletop game based on this book. Just throwing that out there. So hilariously, they ask him if they, the, the police officers ask him if the Knights of the Basement gave him anything, and he said that they gave him a chain. Um, what he didn't mention was that they gave him a shotgun. Just imagine how bad it would have been if Blake had been caught by the police with that shotgun. See, not everything goes as bad as it could possibly go. So at the end of this section, Blake 
wakes up Rose by just bleeding everywhere after cutting his arms on the side of the toilet. Um, but now that Rose has been gone for like seven chapters, I think, I just want to point out that Blake never once thought of not waking Rose back up. Um, I know he vowed to help her, but it didn't even occur to him to not wake her back up. He said that he felt so much better when she wasn't around because he was siphoning energy from her. Um, he could have just let her sleep. Um, and he didn't. It would have been a real dick move if he did, though. Uh, so the knights of the basement have a team member who can lie. So that's either a witch hunter or just somebody's wife that just hangs around. Um, which is actually a really good team member to have. Um, just have the designated liar on the team. That's pretty cool. The whole stairs thing gave me nightmares about Super Mario 64, which I thought I was done with. So a thought that occurred to me is, um, so, so Duncan swore that he would not let Blake leave the building. And if he doesn't keep to that, um, he's forsworn because he swore this to Laird. Um, isn't it kind of a dick move for Laird to have his nephew swear something and risk being forsworn? Especially when he knows that Blake isn't a total idiot. I mean, isn't isn't it kind of a dick move for Lair to do X is probably something that's going to come up a couple more times, but still. Yeah, so at one point during the whole stairs thing, Duncan says, I'm not evil. I'm not doing evil. I'm only doing what I can to keep this situation contained. And quite frankly, it's kind of a rush to do it with the family's backing. I go years without doing anything on even half the scale. Some people do bad stuff and then they say, well, I'm not evil. And they think it makes them complicated. It doesn't make you complicated. It makes you a liar. If you do bad things, eventually you become a bad person. Um, a bad person is a person who does bad things. And if you keep, here I go, doing evil again, it doesn't make you a saint, Duncan. Um, at some point during this scene, uh, Rose breaks a window and she has a hand for a second. And this happens a couple of times during this. Um, this hasn't come up before, or maybe it just came up like once. Um, but this is, but the fact that she does this multiple times in this section shows that it is some kind of power up. So this is new and we're definitely going somewhere with it. Um, especially because Duncan is able to grab her wrist. That is interesting. Blake tells Evan to leave and to run away so that Duncan doesn't throw salt on him. Rose says that Blake exists. So Evan runs and then he reappears at the top of the stairs and is able to send Duncan down the stairs by screaming in his ear. Um, but Evan did not need to do this. Evan, uh, Duncan did not know that Evan was going to come back. This was Evan's third opportunity to leave that became a commitment. Um, he, he could have left and continued to just haunt the police station for the end of time, but he wants to go with Blake. When he and, when, when Blake and Evan are, are discussing, like, what the terms of their familiarity will be, um, Blake makes Evan swear that he will move on if Blake dies. I'm not sure how I feel about this. Evan has wanted to be alive very much for the last year-ish, and it's entirely possible that Blake is going to die in the next week. So... He's making Evan promise that he'll move on when Blake dies. But that could be tomorrow. Like, Blake is getting better, but I wouldn't qualify him as good yet. So, I don't know how I feel about this, but I'm sh I am certain that this will come back up. With the whole fam fam uh, familiar ceremony thing being compared to marriage, and, um, and them doing it over Evan's corpse. Yeah, if anybody, if anybody ever asks me to marry them, I will respond over my dead body. And they'll just not even know whether I mean no because of 
because of the pack. <laughs> so 5.4. Um, so Blake and Evan do the whole familiar ceremony thing and um, I don't know how much this locks stuff in, but uh, Rose nods a lot and helps Evan along with his vows throughout the ceremony. And um, later on we see that all three of them are kind of sharing a power pool. Um, so I wonder if Blake nodding and stuff as I wonder if Rose nodding and stuff as part of Blake is um, has anything to do with that whole procedure you know she has to agree to it in order for that to be or all parts of Blake have to agree to it in order for that to go through or whatever I don't know so I want to talk a little bit more about the bond between Evan and Blake um, based on what we see here in this whole ceremony thing um, so when Blake makes promises to Rose, they don't really mean anything. Um, he says he will help Rose, and he is doing stuff that does help Rose, um, well, as, as much as he's able, but they don't dictate his lifestyle. Um, he knows that at some point he will be helping Rose, and that he will get her out of her situation, but he's still able to kind of go, go along at his own pace and at his at, with his own strategy Blake binding himself to an eight-year-old and promising to fight the, the bad things only is a commitment to the lifestyle that was outlined in Black Lamb's Blood which is a book that he read yesterday by the way um because Evan is eight well he, well, he died when he was eight and he's always going to be eight so 60 years from now Blake will not be holding orgies with the devil like that one lady in uh, Black Lamb's Blood because his familiar will still be an eight-year-old boy who turns into a bird. Um, assuming Blake is still alive at that point, of course. By, by binding himself to Evan, Blake has committed to be somebody worthy of taking care of an eight-year-old and somebody who hangs out with an eight-year-old who is probably a boy scout. But what does Evan specifically, outside of being eight, bring to this? Um, well, Blake admires in Evan exactly what he feels he doesn't have, which is the ability to keep running and fighting when it, when it seems hopeless. Um, Blake talked a lot last week about how when things got tough, when things get tough, he freezes. Him choosing someone who can find him ways out and find him loopholes and stuff makes it so that he is far less likely to get into a situation where he can't get out ever again. Um, especially with the form that Evan ends up taking, which is a tiny bird that can kind of sneak around and blend in. In, in fact, he asked Evan to be his familiar so that he could find him ways out of impossible situations. Um, and he does a really, really good job. I'm so proud of him. I don't really have any other points for this chapter other than Duncan warns Blake that something bad will enter his blood if he keeps cutting his arms on the side of a jail cell toilet. It's hepatitis. Hepatitis is what will fill his blood. So I want to talk about, um, so I want to talk about stuff that I've learned this week. And this is just kind of a, an overall um, kind of commentary on Wilder's work. But the thing that I want to bring up is, for those of us on the sidelines, it's, it's easy for us to, it's much easier for us to analyze Blake's character and behavior than it is for us to analyze our own. But once you analyze something in Blake, um, you are able to recognize it more easily in yourself. Um, and this is, this is how it is for, for many other, for, for almost the entire cast of all of Wild Bo's books. Um, especially when Wild Bo's books have podcasts that you can listen to where they analyze every single sentence. Um, but you're able to kind of go, hmm, person who doesn't keep promises, that's familiar. Um, but 
because of the wide variety of characters and the fact that we see them over such a long time, you see all these ways that they try and fail or try and succeed to get over their baggage. You also see a lot of people who don't get over their baggage but find ways around it. And in this case, I'm thinking of Blake with Evan. Um, Blake is never going to be able... Okay, Blake is not in the in the foreseeable future going to be able to be comfortable around someone physically power more powerful than him, or even someone equally powerful than him. Um, he talks about how he's uncomfortable around Joel um, physically, even though Joel is one of the people he loves most in the world. But he finds a way to be physically close to someone else in a completely different capacity with Evan, um, whom he is comfortable around. And it allows us, the reader, to think about our own lives, you know? What, what is a way that we could potentially get around our own hiccups? Um, is, am I looking at solving my own problems the wrong way? Am I hoping for something that maybe I shouldn't be trying to attain? Am I, am I a different person now? And I can't go back, back to the way I was before. Um, but Wild Bo's books show us a, a huge, Wild Bo's books show us a huge variety of people who have been changed fundamentally and are not going to return to normalcy. They're going to have some kind of new normal. Um, but they show us that that's okay. And that life doesn't have to go back to the way it was. So yeah, um, that's that's chapters 4.10 through 5.4. Next week, we're starting with 5.5. See you at the next one.